This is Duke University. Good evening, everyone. Just think, you are missing a basketball game for this. You chose very, very well. My name is Norman Wurzba, and I direct the Henry Luce Foundation-funded project called Facing the Anthropocene, Rethinking Humanity's Place in the World. As you may know, the Anthropocene marks the moment when humanity, or at least some expressions of it, become a dominant planetary force, influencing geophysical and life systems from the cellular all the way to atmospheric levels. If at one time people understood themselves to be dwarfed and limited by the various powers of nature, the situation now seems reversed. How should we think human agency or telos or purpose in this new context? What economic and political legal forms do we need to promote a livable, perhaps even a beautiful world for multi-species flourishing? Our contemporary universities and their many disciplinary specialties up for the task. These are the sorts of conversations that we have been trying to host and catalyze over the last two and a half years. As part of our programming, we host each semester a university and community-wide lecture and discussion like the one we have here tonight. I should also note that a senior team of scholars has been meeting for the last two years to look hard and fast at these questions. We will present some of our findings at a conference this semester here in this very room, March 26 to 28, at a conference called Hope for a Planet in Peril. And if you're interested, you can find information and registration, which is free, uh, at the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke. Just type in Hope for a Planet in Peril. It is now a great honor and unique pleasure for me to welcome and introduce tonight's speaker, James C. Scott is Sterling Professor of Political Science at Yale University, where he also has held appointments in the Department of Anthropology, the School of Forestry and Environment, and the Institute for Social and Policy Studies. He also founded and co-directed the Agrarian Studies Program for multiple years. The list of his accomplishments and recognitions is extraordinary. NEH and Guggenheim Fellowships, being elected a fellow at Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, prestigious lectureships like the Tanner Lectures at Harvard, honorary doctorates and international prizes. He's also written multiple path-breaking books, including The Moral Economy of the Peasant, Subsistence and Rebellion in Southeast Asia, Weapons of the Weak, Everyday Forms of Peasant Resistance, Domination and the Arts, Hidden Transcripts, Seeing Like a State, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed, The Art of Not Being Governed, An Anarchist History of Upland Southeast Asia, Two Cheers for Anarchism, Six Easy Pieces on Autonomy, Dignity, and Meaningful Work and Play, and then most recently, Against the Grain, A Deep History of the First Agrarian States. All of these titles have been translated into multiple languages, and I encourage you to read them. I first encountered Jim's work at the University of Saskatchewan in 1994. I was a recently hired philosophy professor there, and a friend told me that there was this Yale political scientist on campus talking about Russian agriculture and politics. I went mostly because I had family members who had farmed in the Bloodlands region between Germany and Russia during the war years. I was completely taken by his description of peasant life. I had not ever encountered a scholar who took peasants seriously at all, took them seriously enough to see value in their modes of work and life. And I've read his work ever since. Without fail, I find in him a thinker and a writer who challenges the basic categories by which we make sense of our world. And then, when I learned later on that Jim also spends part of every day taking care of livestock on his farm in Connecticut, I knew I could trust him. Why? Because I happen to agree with the ancient peasant judgment that says, the earth shows up those of value and those who are good for nothing. How can you not learn from someone who says, I'm as proud of knowing how to shear sheep as I am of anything? or who understands that taking care of animals and doing physical labor, like mucking a barn or feeding chickens, 
actually makes him a better scholar. We're so glad you're here tonight, Jim. Please join me in welcoming Jim Scott to the podium. Let, let me just say that we will have a little bit of time for Q&A, so be thinking of questions that you would like to ask. Thank you for that um, lavish introduction. The problem with lavish introductions is the speaker seldom lives up to the promise that uh, introduction uh, held out. Um, and I'm also not used to speaking in uh, a particular setting like this, and I hope I am not going to desecrate uh, my surroundings, although desecration is about what most of my books have been about, essentially. The title of the, of the talk is In Praise of Floods, uh, and it's looking forward to a book that I hope to write on the Irrawaddy River, a deep ecological history of the Irrawaddy River, the main river uh, in Burma. Uh, 20 years ago, I would never have dreamed that I'd be writing a book about rivers. Um, I'd spend a lot of time canoeing and fishing on rivers, um, but hadn't taken it as um, a subject for my, uh, if you like, scholarly life. However, when I started to teach a seminar seven or eight years ago on rivers, I remembered an exchange that has always stuck in my mind. I was at a meeting in which um, there were two uh, meetings going on at the same venue. One of them was for Southeast Asianists, of which I was one, and the other were professional engineers and hydrologists who, for whom river engineering was uh, their uh, metier. We were told at the conference site that we should be good to one another and we should sit with them and make conversation um, and fraternize at lunch and dinner. And being a good little boy, at least then, um, I, uh, I found myself next to a very bright Philippine uh, hydrologist. And I realized it was my job to make conversation. And I had just learned in the year before that the Colorado River never got to the sea for most of the year. And for some reason, I had this sense of sadness on behalf of the Colorado, all our poems about rivers running to the sea. And I felt somehow that the, um, that the Colorado had been deprived of something essential. And just in order to make conversation, because it was the only thing I could think of at the time about rivers to share with this Philippine engineer, I said, isn't it a shame that the Colorado River never gets to the sea? And he turned to me in a flash and said, oh no, it's the best thing that could possibly happen to the river. It means that every drop of water is used for some important human use and not a single drop goes to waste. And I realized that this man and I were not going to have a long conversation <laughs> about rivers. He was, however, not alone. Winston Churchill, I quote, one day, this is actually relevant to what's happening in the Ethiopian dam building today. Winston Churchill wrote, one day, every last drop of water which drains into the whole valley of the Nile shall be equally and amicably divided among the river people, and the Nile itself shall perish gloriously and never reach the sea. Joseph Stalin, somewhat less poetically, said, water which is allowed to enter the sea is wasted. And in fact, if I were so inclined, I could quote uh, the American Bureau of Reclamation and the Army Corps of Engineers ad infinitum, uh, essentially to the same uh, tune. Rivers are alive. They're born, they live, they die. Um, and in fact, everything 
If you open the temporal lens widely enough, everything moves, nothing is static. Uh, and if I had the, um, the graphic that I would like to show you, it would be the graphic of after the last glacial maximum, 18,000 years ago, as the climate uh, steadily warms, the beech trees and oak trees that are in refugia uh, along the Mediterranean start marching north, all right? And if you had, in a sense, a time-lapse photograph of every 100 years, you'd see the beaches and, and oaks going all the way up to sort of Norway and northern Germany over time, bringing with them, of course, all the insects and animals uh, and fish and soils and so on that uh, are part of their suite of relations with other species. Um, I don't have that, but I do have a... Um, uh, an image of the last 120,000 years of the movement of the polar ice cap. Um, and in fact, it's only, if one thinks of the St. Lawrence Seaway, the St. Lawrence Seaway only came into be, or the St. Lawrence River, only came into being with the breaking up of the glacial lake called Lake Agassiz after the geographer, um, uh, after the last glacial maximum. So many rivers that we think of as being there in memorial uh, are products of the last glaciation, particularly in the temperate climates. You can see the retreat and advance of the polar ice cap. This is again starting 120,000 years ago, and it's only the very last patch will be the last glacial maximum 18,000 years ago, and you will notice how hugely, um, what, um, how much it extends uh, to the south. That's an earlier one there. I think this must be the last one. Now, this is actually a kind of magnificent uh, map um, produced of the Mississippi River by the Army Corps of Engineers, and it's the last thousand years of its meanders and beds uh, and channels over time. So you can see the enormous changes over time in terms of how the river has moved and occupied different territory uh, over time. It's another one of a different portion of the river. There are, I think, something like 22 maps that make actually a quite beautiful um, quasi-abstract um, image of a river that would be uh, beautiful in an art gallery quite apart from demonstrating that rivers uh, are moving. Um, on the, on the theme of rivers uh, also moving, this is the estuary of the Yellow River. Um, and since it has the major shifts north and south of the Shandong Peninsula of the Yellow River since 2200 BC. Um, and the second slide, also shows the shifts in the major distributaries of the river from the last two centuries alone. This is a river that because you have a coastal plain that has a very, very low gradient, is a very unstable uh, and movable river. It produces by the dropping of silt its own obstacle. It creates a levee in front of it as it slows down on the coastal plain. And as that levee builds up, it shoots to the side and seeks a different way to the sea. So in a sense, there are the natural changes because of the gradient and the amount of silt carried by the Yellow River, which is why it's called the Yellow River, of course, uh, makes an enormous difference in its instability and the way it moves north and south historically of the Shandong Peninsula. This was taken advantage of in 1938 when Chiang Kai-shek purposely broke the dikes 
of the Yellow River in order to send it south to slow the Japanese advance uh, to the north. It was successful, but it's estimated that it cost the lives of something like 300,000 Chinese peasants. Each flood raises the land flooded by a deposition of sediment so that the flood pane, for example, of the Middle Nile is now 10 feet higher than it was 5,000 years ago. George Perkins Marsh understood all of this in his great book, Man and Nature, which was published in 1864. Thus, river port towns and coastal towns at a river's mouth are vulnerable to being blocked by the buildup of silt. For example, we owe our, uh, the beautiful uh, medieval uh, town of Bruges uh, to this effect. It was the great liner, linen center, and its river artery, the Zvin, uh, silted up in the 15th century, and the merchants packed up and moved to Antwerp, leaving an urban gem and museum piece for um, uh, our pleasure, if you like. Brisach on the Upper Rhine in Roman times was on the left bank of the Rhine. In the 10th century, it was an island in the middle of the Rhine. In the 13th century, it was on the left bank again. And now, after the 14th century, it's on the right bank. This has happened to thousands and thousands of river towns and ports historically. But change can come gradually or precipitously. Um, we had a family tradition of spending all summer long on uh, Penn's Creek in central Pennsylvania, uh, uh, a stream that you could throw a stone across, more or less. Um, and I observed every year how the ice in the spring had carved out the meanders uh, such that the river, uh, the stream was changing banks gradually uh, by accretion over time. And it was my way of thinking about the process of geological change and the change uh, in rivers. And then, to my surprise, and the surprise of most others, in 1972, there was a huge flood. And 99% of the changes in that stream occurred during the high water period of a few hours in that flood. It made new channels. It cut off old meanders, leaving oxbows, uh, and so on. And the fact is that uh, the change comes to streams and rivers like this, usually precipitously and massively, uh, rather than in these slow uh, processes of accretion. This is just a, an example of the natural meanders since the river in the loop of the meander runs faster, it's always gouging out more uh, of, the, of the raw material that forms the bank. Here you have an example of a meander that has been cut off by a flood, right? The ox, famous oxbow. And you can see on the far left, uh, an oxbow about to happen in the next flood, perhaps. The river is moving all the time. Um, on the Irrawaddy River, that is the main river of Burmese culture, the trip downstream from Mandalay to the ancient capital of Pagan is one daylight trip. I took it several times in a small inboard motorboat carrying no more than 20 passengers. What was interesting to me is that on a sail that lasted a trip that lasted maybe nine hours, nine and a half hours, we used four different pilots who were picked up along the way in order to guide us through the channels and banks um, uh, and sand drifts of the river and how the channel had changed over the last week or so. That is to say, this pilot had been running this trip for 20 or 30 years, but he did not trust himself uh, for even this passage of like two hours. So we would pick up from a village a pilot who would be with us for about two hours, and then when his knowledge of the river ran out, he would get down and someone else, would, another pilot would get on for the next two hours. So you had these specialists in little sections of the river that were changing all the time. 
Um, and the fact is that the when you're going downstream, the dangers are much greater because if you run into a sandbank, the current is embedding you in the sandbank and it's harder to back off. Uh, and so uh, it's in a sense, that's the reason why uh, boats going downstream have the right of way over boats going upstream because if upstream boats get caught, it's rather easier for them to back off because the current is helping them back off. Uh, so uh, those of you who are familiar with Mark Twain's work will notice that rather than twine, right, Mark, Mark Twain, uh, so many fathoms that uh, great bamboo poles, which are marked by um, demarcations of each foot. Uh, and so there are people just like on the Mississippi at the front when they get to shallow areas of the river who are yelling out, you know, less than five feet, more than five feet in Burmese, of course. Um, and that is the way in which even with pilots, you need to have people who are taking constant soundings uh, of the river bottom uh, because this, the clearance is no more than a foot or two. Uh, this will not make any sense to you. Uh, so I'll show the next one. So occasionally, um, uh, even larger boats, and this was the case of a larger boat, uh, gets caught. Uh, and then the question is, how do you get yourself off a sandbank? And what the, the standard procedure, you can see how shallow the water is in this particular place. So three people have gotten out are embedding uh, a, a pointed pole deep into the river bottom to which a cable and winch at the back of the ship are attached so that the ship can wiggle itself, right, back and forth and back and forth uh, to create the, uh, the flow of water that will allow it to slowly back off uh, the edge uh, uh, of the sandbank. But getting struck, stuck is very commonplace, and it often happens that the ship cannot get off at all, uh, and that it is moored there until the next monsoon, uh, which raises the river level so that they can finally uh, move. Um, this means, by the way, um, that uh, the idea of a, a living river that's moving all the time means that concepts that we hear on the radio and on television all the time about a hundred year flood are absolute nonsense. And a 500 year flood is even greater nonsense. The Rhine, for example, had so-called four hundred year floods within 12 years. In 1983, in 1988, in 93, and then again in 94. It should give you some pause uh, if you can have 1,200 year floods in a uh, 400 year floods in a 12 year period, uh, whether the concept of a 100 year flood makes any sense uh, anymore. The reason why there's no such thing as a 100 year flood uh, is twofold. For most rivers, we simply do not have the statistical series of level and volume flows that go back more than 100 years or 200 years, which would in principle allow us to make any statistical generalizations. The Yellow River or the Yangtze or the Rhine or Danube are partial exceptions because they go back 500 or 1,000 years, um, but still the data is rare. More important, and this is the crucial thing, I think, is that even if you had a deep statistical series, the assumption of a 100-year flood assumes that you have a hydrological equilibrium, that you're dealing with the same river that you dealt with 100 years ago. Uh, and that, of course, is complete nonsense. It's not the same river from year to year. It's moving silt and, and sand and clay. It's carving new channels and meanders. Its normal flood stage is building natural levees that change the structure of the river. And if we add anthropogenic changes, that is to say the river itself is modifying itself by its natural movements, but it is also being changed anthropogenically. So in 1800, for example, most of the Mississippi River's banks 
were forested. By 1960, 95% were occupied by agricultural crops, and therefore the runoff was far faster, and water that would have taken three weeks to get to New Orleans from Minnesota uh, only took four or five days. Um, so the most reliable aspect of river movement is what is called the flood pulse. It's the most important movement in the annual life of a river. It's that part of the year during which the river overflows its channel banks and occupies its habitual floodplain. The pulse of high water may come from the monsoon, from snow or glacier melt, from seasonal rainfall, and it may be of different degrees of variability. But it is a completely natural part of the annual cycle of a river. The flooding of the floodplain represents the lungs of a river. In a literal sense, the condition of its vitality and that of the creatures who depend upon it. Without the annual flooding of the floodplain and the channel, and we usually associate our pictures, our landscapes and photographs of rivers, are, is a river at peace in which the river is, occupies only its channel. This channel, all by itself, is comparatively dead, biotically speaking. Flood is a scare word and is so deeply anthropocentric that I want to ban its use, but, but I expect I won't have much luck. It's just the river breathing deeply as it must. On this view, we would understand a flooding of settlements near the river as a result of Homo sapiens encroaching on the natural floodplain to be the crime of trespass against the river. The periodic flooding of the floodplains is um, the life world and the condition of existence of all the species that inhabit the river or who dwell along the river. Fish, for example, get as much as 80% of their total annual nutrition from this moment of the flood pulse, the flood stage that allows these species to spread over the floodplain, to spawn, to put on weight. They feed on the invertebrates, the decaying organic matter, the microbes that are on the floodplain. Huge migrations of fish take advantage of this feeding frenzy. Anadromous fish, salmon, uh, alewives, um, herring, and shad, um, not to mention non-seagoing fish, rush for this food. The floodplain may, in some cases, be 40 times greater than the width of the channel. In the Amazon, there's a huge variation uh, in water level uh, and in the size of the Amazon, depending on the season. There are even in the Amazon fruit-eating fish. When the water gets very high, it reaches the lower branches so that the fish can actually take the low-hanging fruit, if you like. The Mississippi fish catch, which had declined 83% over 50 years, experienced the 1993 massive flood and had the biggest catch it had had in more than 100 years the year after because of the spawning and growth uh, and the effects of the flood on the fish. The studies of the Danube have shown that the greater the extent of the flood in a given year, the greater the fish haul the year after. Uh, and here I can't resist uh, the, the migrating, the migration of fish in huge numbers uh, is all about uh, taking advantage of uh, flooding and the nutrition that's available in the floodplain. There's John McPhee has a wonderful book called The Founding Fish. It's about the history of the shad. And it turns out, according to him, it's a, some dispute, but I think it's fairly well established, that uh, Washington's troops were running out of food at Valley Forge uh, on the Schuylkill, which was a tributary, um, uh, a tributary of what river? Uh, the Delaware, uh, tributary of the Delaware. Uh, and uh, 
Washington was furiously writing letters to the Continental Congress for uh, more fish and uh, more barrels of, of fat and flour and so on. And it just so happened that as the army was breaking up, the annual shad run began. Um, and as a result, the Continental Army had uh, eight days of as much shad as they could possibly have eaten, and they saved the revolution, according to John McPhee, so that without the shad, uh, we would have still been a colony. It's not just fish, but a whole cavalcade of creatures of all those creatures who depend on such concentration of nutrition. Waterfowl, riverine wetland birds, heron, muskrats, fox, wolves, raptors, herbivores, coming for the fresh grass sprouting after the flood recedes, and all the microparasites that feed on the cavalcade. As the flood recedes, much of this nutrition returns to the channel where some of the larger fish, like channel catfish, sort of benefit as well as the comparatively immobile shellfish clams and bottom-feeding larvae. That is to say, the nutrition that exists within the channel is itself a gift of the flood pulse and the return of all this nutritional material back into uh, the channel. What the flood does, in one sense, is to provide connectivity. Um, it moves water over the landscape, creating a huge variety of habitats. There, it creates backwaters, ponds, and marsh environments, and slow-moving warmer water, where refugees from larger predators can take refuge. Um, it has varied assemblages of food and habitat that favor different riverine species. The whole mechanism depends on the microbial richness of the floodplain that represents the base of the food pyramid for the entire life world of the river. Without the flood pulse, then, the river is comparatively dead. Uh, I'm afraid this is probably uh, uh, illegible from the distance that you're at, uh, but it is a picture of the the movement of floodwaters up uh, from the channel into the immediate area, often grassland, and then into trees, and then as it comes back over time. And this is, in fact, um, uh, as I will point out, uh, the basis for the original form of agriculture. Um, I mean to emphasize non-human species here for, for the reason that in the seminar that I teach, it's very hard to get my students to not think of a river as just so much H2O that has to be divided between claimant A, B, C, and D. And so my goal is to have them see the river as the life world of hundreds of species and to uh, stop them from concentrating simply on who gets how much of the Yellow River, who gets how much of the Yangtze, and so on. I do, however, let me say something about what the flood pulse does for Homo sapiens, the most numerous and successful invasive the world has known. Well, it's responsible for civilization. No floodplain, no civilization. Almost without exception, all archaic civilizations were founded on floodplains, often near the estuary of a river. Why? It's the only place where you can have a concentration of foodstuffs and people in a small circumference in which state making is possible. See what the flood does. First of all, it drowns all the competing vegetation. It does the weeding. It lays down a layer of nutritious silt that provides nutrients for crops, usually cereal grains. It provides, if well-behaved, as in the Nile Valley generally, a perfectly harrowed field ready for sowing. No plowing needed. All you have to do is broadcast the seeds. Hence, the oldest form of agriculture was flood recession agriculture or flood retreat agriculture. Uh, this was practiced by uh, the woodland cultures of the eastern United States uh, before the European conquest. Uh, in all these areas that were, if you like, uh, the bottom lands and long streams where most of this planting uh, took place in 
the eastern woodland uh, culture. It's still practiced around the world, I might add. This is uh, in Upper Burma. Uh, this is an area, it's actually an island uh, that people access by virtue of a bamboo bridge that's rebuilt every year. And it's a huge island that is totally uh, flood retreat agriculture. And it's competed for by uh, neighboring villages because it is the most valuable uh, property, agricultural property you could possibly uh, imagine. Whoops. And not to privilege the state, the flood pulse has been essential to the creation of habitats that favor those who want to evade or remain outside the state as well. And it's because many of these habitats are illegible. So many of you may be familiar with the marsh Arabs, uh, who were finally destroyed as a culture by Saddam Hussein, who drained the marshes south of Basra. Um, you can see what's left of the marshes at uh, different uh, periods. Um, this is actually the habitat of the marsh Arabs, many of whom lived on, who were escapees from other parts of uh, Iraq and, uh, and neighboring states, uh, getting away from taxes, from uh, from the law, such as it was, uh, deserters, uh, uh, people fleeing epidemics, and so on. Um, this is a, the hall of a sheikh uh, in the Marsh Islands. This is completely built with reeds and rebuilt every year by putting a new layer of flooring because the flooring under it is in the process of disintegrating. Uh, because it's floating rather than, or it's on mud uh, rather than on dry ground. Uh, but it's quite an elegant, uh, uh, elegant form of architecture done solely with reeds from the Marsh Arabs. Um, after, of course, this is what that habitat looks like, and most of the Marsh Arabs are beggars in Basra and in Baghdad. Um, This is, some of you may be familiar, the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, at the beginning of the Civil War, uh, there were 6,000 escaped slaves in the Great Dismal Swamp because if you couldn't get to the north, you couldn't get to Canada, uh, you could hide out in the swamps. And there were, according to most of the accounts, uh, people who had lived in the swamps and never seen a white person. Uh, Native Americans were also uh, in the Great Dismal Swamp, uh, and it was a place where you could uh, disappear and not be sought successfully by the law or slave catchers uh, and so on. For those of you who haven't read it, um, after Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harry Beecher Stowe wrote a less successful but better book called Dread, uh, about the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, and if you haven't read it, uh, I recommend it. It's her, partly her penance for things she thought she got wrong in Uncle Tom's Cabin. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. I'll, I'll, I'll stay closer. I was, uh, it, it kept popping like, like that. It scares me, so. Uh, that's Harriet Peters Dome. And this is um, in the Huai River Delta between the Yangtze uh, and the Yellow River is the Huai River. Uh, and there's a great uh, Chinese classic called the Water Margin Novel that is um, uh, a very much like a good Western in terms of outlaws who've been running away uh, from, uh, from Chinese kingdoms over time, uh, and they all congregate in the Hawaii River Delta. And uh, Chinese who know Chinese culture and the classics actually know that there are 108 heroes 
uh, in the Water Margin novel, and you can buy decks of cards uh, in which each hero is depicted by a particular uh, uh, image, and in this particular case, uh, this is one of the more famous uh, images. Um, this is um, a picture unrelated to what I'm saying right now, but this is the Rhine River, and the straight line essentially is the rectified Rhine, uh, that is to say, the Rhine that was reduced by 143 kilometers in order to make it flow faster and so on. Uh, and these were all the meanders and so on that were removed from it. Um, so the best way I think of conceptualizing what flood, uh, naturally occurring floods do, is through the field of disturbance ecology. I don't like the term disturbance here because it risks obscuring the fact that floods are often annual, natural, and fairly predictable. That is to say, they are not disturbances. Such disturbances are normal. But it is proposed in contradis contradistinction to equilibrium analysis in which the succession and distribution of fish and insects and birds was imagined to have reached some terminal state that was stable. As we shall see, it's the prevention, the forceful stopping of these natural perturbations that is the real disturbance, the real intervention, the attempt to enforce a permanent equilibrium. And these floods, of course, as I mentioned, create new mosaics of plants and animals and insects. They open the canopy. They destroy or displace many species, and they begin a succession of new colonists. The result is more biodiversity in terms of the variety of species. And this mosaic of patches, as it's often called in ecology, is in turn more resilient. Recall what the flood accomplishes. It eliminates the previous vegetation. It soaks the soil deeply. It brings in nutritious silt. It's an opening, open and inviting environment waiting to be colonized. Colonized by flood-adapted marine life, by flood-adapted insect life, by flood-adapted flora, seeds that have been waiting for a long time for the flood will suddenly sprout uh, and flower. It creates patches of slower colonization nearby. It's a favorable spawning environment for a whole selection of fish, insects, and birds who do best in these uncrowded open environments that the flood creates. It creates innumerable edge environments, and we know that these edge environments are particularly rich because they give the creatures that live uh, at the margins an effort to move between two different ecosystems and take advantage of the nutrition available from either side. That's what happens without humans. Humans can use and shape this process. Along the Nile, what Egyptian peasants did historically was to simply poke a hole in the natural levee at flood stage. When they did so, the flood, the waters came through and went down the back slopes with silt-rich water. And when the water had soaked the area that they wanted to be soaked, they plugged up uh, the slot that they had made to admit that water. Uh, and they had, if you like, uh, a naturally um, fertilized uh, field uh, that they could then plant. So flood recession agriculture is the simplest. It uses nature to do the work with a little nudge. And in fact, it compares so favorably to plow agriculture that whenever it is possible, uh, people avail themselves of this opportunity. Notice the parallel with fire. Another natural disturbance, only somewhat less predictable. Fire kills much of the previous flora and opens the canopy. There are fire-adapted species, such as pines, whose seeds only germinate by fire-created temperatures. 
Then there are the so-called R plants that quickly colonize, like fireweed. There are mushrooms like morel mushrooms. Europeans who collect mushrooms look every year at a map of the forest fires in the western United States, and they plan their vacations to go to an area that's burned out the year before because they know the morel harvest will be spectacular. Again, this happens without humans, but humans can use it. So Sweden cultivation or fire field cultivation or shifting cultivation is like the use of the natural flood for, for recession agriculture, for flood recession agriculture. Uh, it is to fire as uh, flood recession agriculture is to flood. That is to say, uh, in shifting cultivation, the growth that has happened in the, over the last 30, 20 or 30 years is slashed and left to dry uh, by opening the canopy. And when it's dry and the wind is perfect, fire is set. Uh, the ash, which is oxidizing plant matter, provides the fertilizer. Uh, then the field can be planted with broad, broadcast or with a dibble stick and it has to be repeated every few years in a new plot. People went back to shifting cultivation after the Great Plague in Europe, when the population was reduced by a third to a half. People abandoned plow agriculture to go back to the shifting fire field cultivation because it was so much easier and because it was uh, the labor produced a lot more food to eat than plow agriculture did. It is the equivalent of flood recession agriculture, where f fire does the work of water. And fire and flood, of course, are natural phenomenon. We have, over time, by engineering rivers, we've tried to sculpt rivers for our purposes. Um, but only with the invention of dynamite in 1870, and subsequent earth-moving machinery and reinforced concrete has the sculpting taken on protean proportions. It's more like a combination of taxidermy, taxidermy and amputation, I think. Uh, rivers were simplified, and uh, I say simplification because the intervention was often for a single functional purpose. The Rhine is the first striking example. Johann Gottfried Tula, around 1800, actually organized the signing of a treaty called the rectification of the Rhine. I love the term because it looks as if God made a mistake and we're going to fix it here. Um, it was an actual treaty. It eliminated meanders. It remo removed barriers in the channel. It confined the river to a single bed with no braids, uniform with uniform depth, uniform speed of current, ideally, uh, to make it into a canal. What they wanted was a canal, and they re-engineered the river in order to make it as close to a canal as they possibly could. Predictable, uniform, straight, obeying Bernoulli's principle of pressure and turbulence. Take a variable and turn it into a constant. The Rhine was shortened by 105 kilometers, and it lost 80% of its floodplain in the Upper Rhine. There are efforts to restore some of that floodplain in a kind of Disneyland sort of way by theme parks of what the uh, floods used to be like in terms of the wetlands they created. Uh, so that now a drop of water that lands in Switzerland that only takes three days to get to Holland whereas before it took something like 10 or 11 days. George Perkins Marsh understood this simple matter of physics. Let's say a river has a 1,600 mile course. Let's say the channel drops 800 feet from the origin of the river to the sea. That's a drop of six inches to the mile. By shortening the river, cutting off meanders, let's say you make it only 1,200 miles long. Then the pitch is increased to eight inches to the mile. 
It may not seem large, but it has tremendous effects on speed, on how much silt the river can carry, on the height of possible flood crests, and on the erosion of banks. And if you try, then, to minimize floods by preventing lateral flow of the river water with levees, you increase the amount of silt carried to the mouth. The Dutch, of course, paid the price for that with the, with the, the buildup of silt in the estuary uh, at their ports. Uh, Aldo Leopold of Sand County Almanac fame wrote that uh, the Germans had a fondness for unnecessary outdoor geometry. There are other simplifications, hydroelectric dams and irrigation. Uh, hydroelectric dams essentially create a chain of lakes, still water, destroying fish migration in both directions, preventing the national, natural conveyor belt of silt downriver, preventing natural movement. So the question is, when is a river still a river? That's a metaphysical, metaphysical question that I, uh, I can't answer. I had a colleague at the University of Wisconsin and I remember a similar quandary. Um, the, the, my colleague had a cat, and the first time I met the cat, it had just been, uh, it, it was in full catness, if you like. Next time I saw it, it had, uh, it was a female cat. Uh, it had been spayed. Uh, next time I saw the cat, it, uh, they had cropped its tail for some reasons I didn't understand. Uh, and the last time I saw the cat, it had been declawed um, because it was tearing up the furniture and so on. So it led me to ask myself, how many things can you take away from a cat and still call it a cat? All right. And in the same way, I want to sort of pose the question of how many things can you take away from a river and still call it uh, a river? It uh, has lost almost all of you, like its natural movement, its natural organs, uh, and so on. You may call it a river, but it is it has lost almost everything that conveys its riverness. The uh, Flood control along the Yellow River uh, was probably, the Yellow River is the most meddled with river uh, probably in history. Maybe the Euphrates would be a uh, competition. Uh, the growth of population and levees, the deposition of silt raised the bed, and the effort to protect the tax-paying population of cultivators meant that the levees were constantly raised. The result of this is that the river, having nowhere else to deposit its silt, deposited, deposited its silt at the bed of the channel. And the result is that in Kaifeng, the river is 33 feet above the surrounding plain. It's not a river, it's an aqueduct, right? Uh, and it means, of course, that when you get uh, a flood, uh, when the river is raised to that uh, height above the surrounding plain, you get a catastrophic flood, a totally catastrophic flood. The drainage of wetlands for narrow ends of Homo sapiens also obeys the rule of single function replacing complexity and multifaceted uh, ecologies. Rohan D'Souza uh, has a study of the Orissa Delta in which he claims that the English, uh, in coping with the Orissa River, uh, they wanted land or water because you can charge for both of those things. The, well, land gives you property and cadastral surveys and taxes, and water gives you water rates and so on. What the British couldn't, under, couldn't stand was mud. Uh, in this sort of Mary Douglas sense, mud was neither water uh, nor land, and their efforts were to turn all the mud into either land uh, or into water, and destroying the natural irrigation system that people had been accustomed to using before. The Kissimmee River and the Everglades is another example. How am I doing for time? Five minutes or something? Yeah. Um, So I want to make 
a case um, about what we've done to rivers uh, that has a medical equivalent in the concept iatrogenic illnesses. Uh, to say that one has an iatrogenic illness is essentially to put a fancy medical term on the old saying that the cure was worse than the disease. An iatrogenic illness is one that is the result of prior medical treatment. It covers such things as the side effects of prescription drugs, hospital-acquired infections, the superbugs that arise from the fact that we use antibiotics in raising livestock, and so on, uh, the side effects of radiological treatment, complications from surgery. It's been claimed that as much as 70% of admissions to hospital in the US are for iatrogenic conditions, and that such illnesses rival or exceed heart disease and cancer as leading causes of death. Our understanding of floods and fire in this context are illuminated by, illuminated by a particular category of iatrogenic effects in which the successful treatment of one, often relatively modest pathology, directly contributes to a massive pathology much harder or even impossible to treat. That is to say, the general use of antibiotics in livestock rearing to treat a variety of relatively minor bacterial infections and to compensate for the effects of crowding of huge numbers of livestock in a small space encourages the creation by selection of pathogens that are increasingly resistant to existing antibiotics. It's the very success at the smaller scale that creates over time the much larger bacterial threat. Polio, we now know, in its paralytic and life-threatening forms, is an iatrogenic disease. If you take blood samples from children in Mumbai between 5 and 13, you'll find that over 80% of them have antibodies against polio. It means they've already been exposed to the polio virus at a very, very young age when it's benign and generally asymptomatic via the fecal route. Um, polio in the West is largely an effect of uh, highly hygienic environments. If you get it at adolescence and haven't been exposed to it, it can be life-threatening. Same is true, of course, for mumps and measles and chickenpox. Evidence of early stimulation of the immune system by way of contact with germs, bacteria, means far less in the way of allergies. So let me move back again to disturbance ecology and related to iatrogenic Ill conditions. My contention is pretty straightforward. The elimination of small disturbances directly creates the conditions for larger catastrophic disturbances. Preventing small floods, leads to large floods. Preventing small forest fires leads to large forest fires. Take the example of Yellowstone and the era of Smokey the Bear, now actually made fun of for the most part. Uh, the prevention of all forest fires was the effort to create an artificially maintained equilibrium in which the fire service was ordered to extinguish every fire by 10 a.m. the morning after it had been discovered. Fire suppression is an intervention, a human-caused disturbance or elimination of what would be large numbers of naturally occurring fires, 80% of which uh, would be created by lightning strikes. Fire suppression had been a decades-long policy by the Park Service, and they prided themselves on preventing all forest fires. It meant, of course, a huge buildup in combustible material in the forest and an artificial equilibrium that favored intolerant trees that would not have been there in such huge numbers. By suppressing fire, it encouraged the growth of trees that could not tolerate fire because they were, in a sense, protected from it by the suppression of fire. Lodgepole pines at the end of their 200 or 250 year lifespan. And as a result, there was a huge fire in 1988 um, that covered over 3,000 square kilometers and required 9,000 firefighters to put out. 
Incidentally, the experts in the late 60s had already realized that fire was a natural condition, and lighting created fires, uh, uh, lightning created more fires than human fires, but that the policy was only beginning to be applied. And of course, native peoples, both uh, in the United States, in Northern California, uh, and Aborigines in Australia, knew how the use of fire could prevent uh, larger fires uh, over time. Ten years after that great fire uh, of 1988, there were species of trees and plants that had not been seen in decades, and these were fire-adapted species. The great flood on the Mississippi in 1993 was huge as measured by its width, depth, and speed. The effort to impound the Missouri and prevent most floods, to protect the floodplain for settlement and agriculture and development, had the result of exposing everyone downstream. The draining and ditching of wetlands for agriculture and settlement no longer absorb and hold and slowly release the water from the flood pulse. It is released instantly. The result is what I would call political lock-in. In order to save property, guarantee insurance, rebuilding, and so on, uh, there was essentially a systematic effort to protect human settlement in the floodplain from any disturbance even of natural floods. Agricultural crops went up to the river for about 90% of its length, and there was the elimination of previous forests and wetlands. There was a levees-only policy on the Mississippi, which walled the river so that the silt was deposited on the riverbed, raising its bed above the adjacent uh, floodplain, uh, a little like the Yellow River uh, displayed there. The river could not spread laterally. The straightening for navigation plus levees meant a far faster flow. A drop of rain in Big Stone Lake in Minnesota, which would have taken three weeks to get to New Orleans, got there in four days of high water. The runoff was so much faster, the bed of the river that much higher, so that the flood, place was more, flood pulse was much more massive. 1,100 of the 1,500 levees failed and other levees had to be broken in order to release the river to the floodplain. And that was a decision on who would suffer. And you can imagine uh, how that worked out demographically and by income groups. 65 years of river engineering and the billions of dollars spent on it was completely undone. The river broke, in the end, its flimsy chains. Uh, Eight million acres were flooded and there were 12 to $14 billion in flood damages. But this was a classic iatrogenic disaster. Um, and I think that it is, in a sense, the effort to prevent natural disturbances and to freeze a river uh, or to eliminate fire altogether that are at the basis of these iatrogenic illnesses that are much more massive and much more threatening and much more difficult to deal with politically. Thank you. So we have time for questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Thank you. It, as you were talking about the cure being worse than the, the illness, I wondered what might be the overcorrection. Let's say the world politically gets in step and addresses climate change. What, what would be risks of overcorrecting for climate change? It's interesting, I, I can't think that far ahead. 
That is right. Uh, I, I, I would like to live in a world in which that's the thing I worry about, right? Uh, that, but I don't. One of the things, one of the things that uh, it's not part of my talk, but it seems to me it, in terms of climate change, has to be in every talk, and that is that if I've got this right in the year 1750, there were about three quarters of a billion, three quarters of a billion of us homo sapiens. Now we're going on to eight billion. So it seems to me that um, that is a sort of massive increase in the most destructive invasive species. Uh, and that has to be that has to be dealt with. The other thing, it's a, another statistic. Again, I'm getting away from my topic, but Vaclav Schmil, uh, Schmil, who's a, a kind of wild, nice wild man, uh, it, has done calculations that the rest of us would not ever think about. But what he did was to try to compare the total metric tonnage of wild flesh in the world to the total metric tonnage of domesticated flesh. That is to say, you know, elephants, zebras, blah, 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 uh, on one side, and uh, um, uh, industrial farming of chickens and uh, so on. And the ratio, even bracketing homo sapiens is more than nine to one domesticated over wild. I, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but when I read this statistic two or three years ago, it, it, it never stayed far from my consciousness because if you want to know how much of the wild world is left and how much is gone, uh, that's the only statistic you know, you, you need to know. Uh, it's quite astounding. So it seems to me that, that, that Far from, far from overcorrecting. Uh, I mean, there may be nature may be doing some correcting too. Uh, I, I'm not uh, capable of understanding the declining rates of fertility, sperm counts, uh, and so on. Um, and it's not my, it's not my field. But I certainly am not worried by overcorrecting. Uh, Thank you very much. It's on. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you a question in the reverse temporal direction, just uh, to compare the Yellow River with, uh, in ancient society with the Nile, because you had big states in both. Uh, now, I should have read my Wittfogel, but I haven't. And so I wonder if you have thoughts of why one did more inundation or what you call recession, and the other did something else. So uh, without getting into a long discussion of Wittfogel, um, I think Wittfogel has been, um, what, left by the side of the road, and correctly so, at least on oriental despotism. Um, the, um, what's interesting to me about the Nile is that it is, from everything we know, it's the absolute uh, opposite of a hydrological society in terms of state management. That is to say, all of the irrigation along the Nile was done village by village in keeping with a whole series of village traditions. And that may be because the Nile was a relatively well-behaved river uh, for much, uh, for many of the years, right? Uh, so that you could depend on reliable and fairly gentle floods uh, and so on. 
But what's striking is that the state had nothing to do with irrigation. That was something organized at the local level of villages and the greatest pharaohs, uh, although they lived or died, depending on whether it was a good year or a bad year, they did not take into consideration hydrological management. In the, in the Yellow River, um, it seems to me, I have the impression, and this is mostly from a fabulous book that will be published in the next year by Ruth Mostern on the history of the Yellow River, uh, that in a sense, by the time we get to the period in which, um, if Whitfogel is writing, uh, the periods that he's writing about, the Yellow River is already, um, uh, has rates of erosion and loss of cover uh, and becomes a radically, uh, swear I'm looking for, an erratic, an erratic river. Uh, and that is particularly, when it gets to the floodplain, the, the, the Shandong Peninsula, uh, there it becomes probably the most erratic river in the world. Uh, and so I don't, I don't see any evidence. What, what I do see, is the following evidence for Woodfogel, and that is that once you have an established rice growing population on which you depend for your taxes, uh, for your manpower, for your corvée labor, and so on, you then have an interest in building levees in order to protect that population and keep it in place, right? And so in that sense, I see you shaking your head. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, but it's, because the yellow, the upper parts of the Yellow River are deforested very, very earlier, earlier than I had ever imagined, according to Ruth Monster. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your uh, very delightful talk. Your ideas have always been very provocative. Um, I just wanted to ask you about, uh, like, wh while we very much need to praise flood, where can we figure erosion in this calculation? In a sense, because erosion is a part that is created by silt itself. So for South and Southeast Asian rivers, how can we figure erosion in this calculation? Say that, say that again, please. Uh, I'm saying erosion, like erosion of the banks, not the sandbars in the middle, but erosion of the river banks. How, can we f how, how do we need to frame that in the calculation of floods? So it, it seems to me, if you want to think of this as a f hydrologist or physicist might, that every river is a conveyor belt taking soil, sand, uh, and small stone, stony materials um, downriver, right? Uh, and over time, of course, the river is changed by, uh, by all of that. And so the, the erosion of banks it's not as if uh, the river, uh, how shall I put this? The example we saw, let's say, of meanders that are cut off and create oxbows. So that is a natural movement of the river that for a time lowers the rate of erosion because it's cut off the loop and the uh, bow. So the, the river itself, the way water seeks the most economical way to the sea in many respects, um, that, that in, in that sense, uh, it seems to me that the natural movement of the river, although it is always carrying material with it from upstream to downstream, uh, is a, uh, uh, there are perturbations in the degree to which it's doing that, and I guess, um, this is a guess. I guess that if you were to do a history of silt transportation along the Yellow River and 
go over the last 500 years of Yellow River floods. My guess is that there are probably a dozen floods that would account for most of the silt. That those moments of high water, right, then take whole banks that, that make a new channel and so on, that it, there's probably a period of, that might all together aggregated equal three or four weeks when most of the silt was moved from upstream to downstream. I'm, I'm impressed by how catastrophic events, right, uh, have such a, an impact in terms of the geological shape of the river. Thank you for the talk. This, this is a kind of comment to uh, invite further reflection on one section of the talk around the kind of relationship between rivers and different political formations. You've kind of talked about how marsh areas were uh, lent themselves to more kind of anarchist formations that echo some of your earlier work around uplands and kind of fleeing. Um, there's, a, there's a theory that someone like Carl Schmidt picks up on that political formations, we, we tend to imagine them in relation to land, but actually we should imagine them in relation to uh, water formation. So earliest empires were fluvial, then you, the kind of mastery of the sea allows a, a next scale of formation, and then the kind of final formations, mastery of the oceans led by the Dutch, Spanish, and British, and then that allows a certain scale and the kind of creation of singular space and time uh, for both trade and political communication over much larger areas. Just, I kind of say that as an invitation to think, for, invite you to think further about the implications of what you're saying, uh, the connection between rivers and, and different kinds of political formations, if you have any reflect, further reflections on that. Well, I, I, there's part of me wants to give it back to you uh, and, that is to say, I'm <clears throat> it makes me think of um, Fernand Brodel's The Mediterranean World, in which, in a sense, the, although you have all these civilizations that are, that are based on alluvial plains, uh, they can be even upland alluvial fans, for that matter, although they tend to be smaller states, um, that in a sense, the interesting thing that we often miss is how close people are in every meaningful sense of the word when they are joined by easy water as opposed to when they're divided by uh, mountains. So that, so that I think Brodel's insight is that another city on the Mediterranean uh, across 300 miles of easy water is much closer in every meaningful sense than a place that would be 40 miles across mountain passes, right? Uh, and that means that all of Italy and much of Greece, right, is in a sense attached to other littoral uh, places rather than, and when in a sense the, the ease of sail and communication and navigation get to be that you can navigate out, out of the sight of land and you get oceanic uh, trade and so on, then you get, in a sense, an integration at a larger level. In the case of the Irrawaddy River, what's interesting to me is that you go, let's say, 400, 500 miles up and down the Irrawaddy River, and it's Burman culture, Buddhism, uh, their differences uh, of uh, Buddhist rites, their differences uh, of practice, but it's all recognizably, uh, and it's joined by the river by trade and commerce and exchange and monks and uh, uh, merchants and so on, traveling back and forth. If you go 20 miles away from the river into the hills, it's a different language, different culture, uh, different, uh, different size. So somehow, it, for me, the statistic uh, which I actually worked really hard to prove because I couldn't find the original source. Uh, in 1800, it is asserted, and, and I think it can be proven, in 1800, it was faster to go from Southampton, England, to the Cape of Good Hope by ship than it was to go by stagecoach from London to Edinburgh. Now, nobody 
Nobody went by stagecoach from London to Edinburgh. He went by sea, right? Um, but what, what's interesting is, and that's before, that's before steamships, right? Uh, and if you correct for um, certain kinds of, of fast-moving clipper ships and so on, uh, it's, it turns out to be almost correct, right? Uh, a, a very close thing. And, but it's an astounding, to me, you can, of course, carry a lot more on a ship bottom going to South Africa than you can uh, in a stagecoach in any case. And so one of the things that astounded me in Burma is there are these things that are in Malaysia, they're called Shanghai pots, these large pots that people sometimes put rice in, put water, they bathe uh, with them. They're really large uh, ceramic pots. They're very, very difficult. If you put a couple of those into a ox cart filled with hay, chances are it can't go more than 50 miles without cracking somehow. Uh, and so what they do on the Irrawaddy River is they use rattan and bamboo and they build rafts that are floated by these uh, pots themselves that are the flotation device and they are able to move thousands of pots uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles simply by lashing them together in a certain way that allow them to do this transport because it's also much, uh, much more convenient. So I, I may have lost your original question in terms of the, um, but, it, but, it, but the integration across water seems to me, I mean, we, I, I think we understand a lot more about trade routes for even things like obsidian and carnelian beads and so on that, uh, in which we, we haven't given the world credit for being as integrated as it was even in a hunter-gatherer times. Um, but when, uh, when you have a movement by sail across easy water, it changes everything, I think. We have time for one more question. Um, thank you very much. Could you say, uh, something about the draining of, of, of wetlands. It's controversial now, and Mussolini's no one's favorite, but he drained the malarial marshes um, outside Say Rome. Say that again? Ma the draining of the marshes outside Rome by Mussolini. What oh, do the, we do where there's that direct conflict? Uh, the Pontine marshes. Mm -hmm. uh, where. Uh, well, you could say we p could put insecticide and kill all the mosquitoes, but there's no easy solution. I wonder what you say about the whether in some cases these wetlands should be drained. Oh, uh, yes, our, again, I don't want to take, I have a lot to say about this topic. Um, the, so John McPhee makes the following argument that most of what we think of as malarial swamps on the coastal plain which the Pontine, the Pontine marshes would be one of those, uh, are anthropogenic. And his argument is, as you deforested the, um, uh, the headwaters of these rivers, they transported more silt to the coastal plain. And there, uh, as the water slowed, because the coastal plain had a very low gradient, was nearly flat, it would drop its silt, and it would block its own way to the sea, and it would spread to the side and create these malarial swamps. And so he claims, more or less in passing, without giving a whole lot of evidence, that most of the swamps we associate in coastal plains are the creation of deforestation uh, upstream from most of these rivers. It happens that, um, I'm trying to remember the name of a, an historian colleague of mine, uh, uh, Frank Snowden, um, who's an expert on cholera and other diseases in Italy historically. And he has an incredible story about the Pontine Marshes. If, you, if you're interested in the Pontine Marshes, there's a book called The Mussolini Canal that's a kind of novel about all the people moved into the Pontine Marshes after Mussolini uh, drained them. Um, and it turns out that it, German and Italian scientists were the first people who were working in the Pontine Marshes to discover that the Anopheles mosquito was the carrier of malaria. 
they're the people who worked it out. Uh, and they were part of the team that was draining the Pontine Marshes. It turned out that they were both believing fascists and that when Italy surrendered, the so-called stab in the back, uh, they were so uh, furious that they ran the pumps in the opposite direction and reflooded the Pontine Marshes. And the Pontine Marshes had a malarial epidemic for the last for the next eight years until they could uh, uh, redrain uh, the swamp. I don't. I haven't. I'm not sure he's published this, but it's an extraordinary story about the Pontine, the Pontine Marshes. Uh, I mean, each marsh has its own. But I, I think it's generally everybody has thought that. I mean, if you read the Germans about the Slavic marshes and the way the, they are creatures of marshlands and therefore inferior, I mean, somehow this idea that a people are the creation of its ecology uh, and that all of the marshes, the, the Pripyat, Pripyat marshes in Poland, are occupied by inferior Slavic peoples who have to be removed, uh, and it has to be turned into agricultural land because that's the only civilized life. Right? So there's a, there's a whole civilizational discourse that comes together with the relationship between grain agricultural, cereal cultivation uh, uh, on the one hand, and the so-called primitive life of people who dwell in the swamps on the other. Please join me in thanking Jim Scott for coming. <laughs>